Um, the early 20th century socialists believed in something they called the cooperative commonwealth, building a better world and a better society here and now. They advocated socialism, which they defined as the collective ownership and democratic management of the essentials in society, the things that were absolutely necessary to have a good and full life. When my friend Parley P. Christensen, who I wrote on, came back to Utah, a reporter said to him, you tell us you're a radical who believes in solidarity. What does that mean? He said, I think it means getting the gang together. And in some ways, radicals have spent a long time in this country trying to figure out how to get the gang together. What do they agree on? What do they mean when they use terms like cooperative commonwealth, etc.? And how can we work collectively to make that happen? Sometimes more successful than others, I would think. State and local studies often provide us with an arena to test national uh, narratives. What does your book add to or support or challenge in the master narrative? That's a big question. Well, one thing, um, John can pick up on this too, uh, one thing that we discovered very quickly was, unlike many topics, uh, the history of socialism in the United States began with broad studies and then went to state and local studies. Usually it's the other way around. There aren't that many studies of the Socialist Party at the local or state level. There's some, and there's some, some very good studies, uh, but then there, there's more uh, that needs to be done. I would like to think that, as we say in the book, that we see this as a local study, clearly, but hopefully not a parochial study. In other words, we do believe that this helps us understand the broader movement for socialism, particularly uh, in the early 20th century. And in many ways, what was happening here in Utah, in terms of the Socialist Party, was happening elsewhere around the country. And Utah socialists thought of themselves as part of that broad movement to bring about that cooperative commonwealth. They kept in touch, they read party periodicals, they had state newspapers here in Utah that promoted the, the gospel of socialism. They had candidates like Debs and others come through Utah. So they saw themselves as part of a broader national movement. Um, that was in many ways the golden age of socialism in America. Before and subsequently is a, is a little bit of a different story. So in answer directly to your question, I hope that what we uh, do is help, uh, help provide a better understanding of the broader question by looking specifically at what was happening here in Utah. Yeah, and I would, let me just reinforce that. that you know, that's exactly right. Our feeling was that, you know, if, if the goal is to understand um, radicalism in the United States, uh, for example, and, and, and beyond the United States, but specifically in the United States, if the goal is to understand the radical tradition, which has existed from the beginning, then uh, crucial, important to, the, to, to that understanding um, are not only uh, uh, studies uh, on the state and local level, but what we said is detailed studies. Um, and I, I sometimes say that I think this book is overly long. I mean, it's ridiculously long. Um, but it was originally... It could have uh, been longer. Well, it was originally <laughs> longer. Yeah, I mean, it's 400 and, I don't know, what, 50 pages of text. That was a 650-page manuscript. It was originally an 800-page manuscript. Um, I think we said in maybe the introduction, our impulse was to be encyclopedic. That is to, to lay out everything we possibly could in, in great detail about what was going on here. Happily, it's, it, he was cut back. Uh, you know, uh, I have a friend, my wife has a friend who has asserted that uh, any book can be improved by being cut by at least 20%. Okay, so uh, I hope that's what happened here. But, but, you know, like I say, the intention is to do a very detailed study on the state level and, and you know, while there are other studies uh, uh, on the state and local level, I don't think there are enough. There need to be more. And I don't know that there's anyone that really is as detailed as ours is. In the period that this book covers? Uh-huh, yeah. What, what period? Oh, uh, well, basically 1900 to 1920. 
okay. with an introductory chapter that, that uh, talks about radicalism in, in Utah, radical movements from 1847 to 1900. And then a final chapter that talks about radical movements uh, since the decline of the Socialist Party in the mid-20s. So that's just a real sketch. Uh, so, so there's a, a, a whole book to be written uh, expanding that last chapter. I don't know that either of, it, uh, either of us are going to do that. But. I'm, I'm certain that I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, so. Okay, what, what factors, you know, external and internal, came into play in the growth of socialism in Utah? Well, I, I, I guess what I would say is that, um, uh, you know, people in Utah uh, were subject, faced the same um, conditions uh, that people throughout the United States faced. I mean, you know, in lots of ways, Utah's history is unique. We've always said that, but it's not just unique. It's not only unique. And, um, and I mean, the way I would say that sometimes that in, in the late 19th, early 20th century, what the, the American people were faced with was naked capitalism, capitalism at its most naked. I think we, in some ways, we're returning to that, or, you know, right now we're revisiting, um, well, in my view, we're, we're revisiting that. And, and so, you know, what you had in, in Utah, as elsewhere, is um, growing poverty. Um, uh, growing uh, gaps between uh, in wealth and income between rich and poor. Uh, you found you had a, a, a I would say a, a, a governmental system that increasingly supported a corporate agenda as opposed to you know supporting the, the needs and desires of ordinary people. You had uh, a, a long working conditions. And, and living conditions, that, you know, that, that were that were exploited, long hours, um, unsafe working conditions, unsafe living conditions, uh, all of which uh, all of which generated a range of responses. But one of those responses was a radical one. One of those responses was in order to improve uh, to address issues of poverty and uh, the 99% the, the versus the 1%. Uh, and in order to address uh, issues of health and safety, um, uh, a, a radical movement is necessary. And here's the other thing, an important thing that, that a socialist at the time said, and, and uh, we address that in one of my favorite chapters on socialist rhetoric and ideology. You know, what they said, what they did is they mounted a, an ethical critique of, so, of, of capitalism, they said not only does capitalism produce, produce uh, poverty inequality, it basically uh, alienates people from, from, from their real selves. It prevents people from, being, from fulfilling their, their potential because under a, capital, under a system based on the profit motive, uh, competition, private ownership of the means of production, uh, people are treated as objects, they're, treat, they're commodified. Uh, they're valued for um, f for the, the contribution they can make to profit. The cash connection, William James, you know, identified as the most important thing, um, and uh, and that that will always be the case. That is, people will always be uh, treated devalued uh, as long as you have a system. This is the point of view of socialists, uh, based on uh, you know, as long as you have a capitalistic system. Um, uh, so, so uh, uh, I guess what I would say then is that given all the things that were going on at the time, it would be surprising if a radical movement had not arisen, if that had not generated a radical political movement. Uh, I think at some point in the book we draw a comparison just briefly with the, the, uh, the abolitionist movement, well with John Brown. You know, that is, you know, you've got a, a system of, in which millions of people are enslaved and they have been for hundreds of years and it's a brutal, it's a, it's a brutal system, physically and psychologically brutal. Um, in response to that, you get, you get a range of, of responses, uh, an abolitionist movement that has a range of, I would say, you know, moderate 
uh, and but radical uh, tendencies, and one of those is John Brown. It would be uh, it would be surprising if a John Brown had not existed in response to um, the slavery in the United States. It would be surprising, I think, if a socialist movement and a range of other uh, radical movements had not uh, existed in response to conditions, political, economic, social conditions in the United States and in Utah in the late 19, uh, around the turn of the century. Yeah, I think that's really true. And I think these socialists saw themselves as part of a long-standing uh, radical tradition that they would take back through the abolitionist movement, through the suffrage movement, back in fact to the American Revolution. Uh, Revolution, they saw themselves as, as the next generation of, of, of radicals. You know, the old, uh, uh, Utah Phillips, the old uh, IWW folk uh, singer used to say that back in those days it was easier to know, it was clearer to know who the enemy really was. It was more black and white. Well, I don't know that that's true, but, but, but the nature of corporate capitalism in the early 20th century was dramatic in terms of the way it impacted all aspects of American life. A hundred years ago, there was a, another presidential election where four candidates, four major candidates ran, one of whom, Debs the Socialist, said, we need fundamental, uh, we need to change corporate capitalism in a fundamental way and, and replace it with socialism. Three other candidates ran saying, we don't have to fundamentally change it, but we have to fundamentally reform it, and I'm the most progressive, and I'm the most progressive. Uh, and that sort of thing. So we had an election in which the entire campaign is focused on coming to grips with the power of corporate capitalism in America. And, and, and I don't think we have quite that same election this year. I haven't quite seen that. Uh, and when people tell me that Barack Obama is a socialist, I say, you know, I don't quite think that's the case. But we do face, as, as John mentioned, 